shall be compelled to remove the participants who do not abide by this protocols. A very good afternoon to everybody. I, Devaroti, Secretary of Geological Institute, Presidency University, Kolkata, extend my warmest welcome to all our participants and guests hailing from different parts around the world to the eighth lecture session of Geochrome 2022. I shall be your host for the day. I will once again request everyone to keep their microphone and cameras off throughout the session. A Google form has been already sent to all the participants via email and telegram groups along with the joining link. If you are viewing us on YouTube, then please check the description box for the link. It is our utmost pleasure to have with us Professor Morris E. Tucker, School of Arts Sciences, University of Bristol, United Kingdom. Professor Morris E. Tucker is a renowned name in the field of sedimentary petrology, specializing in the field of carbonate sedimentology, especially limestone. His primary research interests are deposition, diagenesis, and geochemistry of carbonate sediments of any age from anywhere, from those forming today right back to some of the oldest. He has published over 160 papers in scientific journals. He has written three universally acclaimed best-selling texts for students and researchers. Sedimentary petrology, sedimentary rocks in the field, carbonate sedimentology. He has also edited nine books, including techniques in sedimentology, carbonate diagenesis, and calculus. We are highly honored to have him with us to deliver a talk on the aforementioned topic. We are sure that this lecture session will be highly enriching and one of its kind. Now, I would request our very own Professor Joydeep Mukhopadhyay, Professor in the Department of Geology, Presidency University, to give a bit more introduction about our speaker and to welcome him to start the session. Thank you, Devarati. I think I'm audible. Yes, sir. Very good morning and good afternoon to all the listeners. And let me welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Geology, Presidency University, in this webinar. It's a very difficult task for a person like me to introduce Professor Maurice Tucker, such a great and eminent scholar and researcher of our times. But I have to do this after. Uh, let me say a few words about Professor Maurice Tucker. Professor Tucker graduated with a first class honors degree in geology from the University of Durham. Actually, University College of Durham is a constituent college of University of Durham, like what we have, the Presidency College as a constituent college of Calcutta University. So then he received his PhD degree in sedimentology from University of Reading. He has extensively traveled across all the continents and held visiting faculty positions at different universities, such as universities in Gottingen, Sierra Leone, University of Cardiff, University of Newcastle upon Tyne, University of California at Berkeley, Institute Francois du Petrol, Paris, and University of Western Australia, Perth. From 1993 to 2011, he held the position of Professor of Geological Sciences at the University of Durham, and from 1998 to 2011, he held the position of prestigious position of Master of the University of College of Durham. Professor Tucker is currently as, is at the University of Bristol, leading there the Carbonate Research Group. Professor Tucker received many laurels and awards. He has served as the president of International Association of Sedimentologists from 1998 to 2002. He was the IS Distinguished Lecturer in 2006, visiting many geological institutes in Eastern Europe, Southern America, and India. He has given innumerable keynotes and conferences and convened many symposia recently, including symposia in Argentina, Croatia, Germany, India, Japan, and Peru. He was the chief editor 
of the journal Sedimentology from 1982 to 1986, assistant editor of Journal of Sedimentary Petrology from 1986 to 1989, and also he served in editorial boards of many journals like FACES, Geologia, Croatia, Geoabstracts, and more recently, Sedimentary Geology. From 1984 to 1987, he was a member of the Research Grants Committee of the UK National Environment Research Council. And from 2005 to 2008, he was a member of the College of the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Professor Tucker received a number of prestigious awards, including the Major Koch Medal of the Geological Society of London in 1994 for his research and work for learned societies, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the British Sedimentological Research Group in 2007, honorary membership of the Academy of Sciences and Arts of Croatia for outstanding contribution to science in 2008, and in February 2009, he received the Medaille André Dumont for major scientific achievements in carbonate sedimentology by Geological Society of Belgium. He has studied carbonate rocks from all parts of the geological record and from all over the world. He has published three phenomenal book and which forms the backbone of the undergraduate and postgraduate studies in sedimentology in most of the universities of the world. And he has published more than 160 peer reviewed papers. Let me take this opportunity to mention here that Calcutta is, is one of the centers of carbonate sedimentology research in our country. And it was initiated in the late 1950s by Professor Shukumal Kumar Chando and Professor Ajit Bhattacharya, Professor Pratik Kumar Bosch from Jadavpur University, Professor Osru Kumar Choudhury from Indian Statistical Institute, and from Professor Anish Kumar Rai at Presidency College, Calcutta. Today, we'll have a, an opportunity to listen to the very upcoming subject that is, uh, I, would, I, would, I would mention here, it's like a subject that will bridge the gap between the terrestrial and astrobiology, the subject on biomarkers, microbes, and viruses in modern microbial mats, dolomites, and other carbonates. So let us invite Professor Tucker to deliver his talk this morning on fossil viruses as new frontiers, the theme of this seminar today. Thank you very much. Professor Tucker, please. Okay, thank you. So let's see if this works. Okay, um, I hope you can see my presentation. Yes? Can you see my presentation? Not yet. You have to again. Yeah, you have to share once again. Please share it again, like that we practiced earlier. Devaruti, please help Professor Takar. Sir, you first open the share tray. Yeah. And then select the screen one slash desktop. So can you find the share tray? Yes. Um, okay, I've got the share content. Then select the uh, entire screen or the first option. Right, I've got the various screens. And now I should be able to. See. Can you see my screen yet? No, sir, it's not visible yet. Uh, sir, can so you share us content. which screen you are sharing actually? After you share your content, there will be several options on the screens. Over there, you have to uh, share the select the first screen. Uh, 
Screen right. number one. Yes, sir. Screen, screen number, screen number one. one. Okay. I click that. Yes, now we can see. Yes, sir. now we can see your screen. Uh, you can go uh, to your presentation now. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. sir. It's okay. fine. It's okay. absolutely fine, sir. Okay. Are we there? Yes? Yes, sir. So I can. Okay. So I will start. Yes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so, okay. 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 Uh, sorry well, to interrupt, sir. Very... There is a small screen there. You can minimize that. The MS Team oh. screen on a. Oh. Left corner, right corner, right bottom yes. corner. You can minimize that, so. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, um, uh, let me just, I have somebody appearing on my screen. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Very kind. It sounds very impressive, but I'm just an ordinary guy um, doing my hobby. I have been studying limestones for a very long time. I think I've been very lucky in my time to have had the opportunity to look at limestones in many parts of the world, in many parts of the geological succession. I feel very lucky indeed. So um, uh, it's nice to be able to talk to you all about my current interest. So for me, Good morning for you. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I have been to Southeast Asia, India, China many times and always enjoyed my visits to those countries. So um, this morning, I'd like to talk to you about my um, latest bit of research, which is dealing with viruses. Um, in the context of, uh, of microbes, of course, bacteria. So there are a lot of people that I've been working with over the last few years from different places in Europe, as you can see on my first slide. So I will talk about these, um, uh, not necessarily new ideas, but bringing attention to everybody about viruses in the earth sciences. OK, so in this talk, I'll have to say a few words to begin with about viruses. But of course, viruses are in the news all the time. So many of you will probably have read about viruses yourself. So I'll also talk about viruses and bacteria, their association, talk about microbial mats, where there are many, many viruses, and the precipitation of minerals there, talk about some um, experimental precipitation of minerals by viruses, some experiments we've been carrying out. Uh, then talk about the fossilization of viruses and viruses in the geological record. And then we'll talk about the significance of viruses in sedimentary processes. And then my very last slide will mention the possibility of viruses in extinction. So as I'm suggesting, viruses are the new frontier in geology, well, especially sedimentology. So I have to say a few words about viruses to begin with. Apologies if you know a lot of this, but just to say a few things by way of introduction. First, viruses are absolutely everywhere in enormous abundance, greater abundance than bacteria. If you take seawater, for example, there are 10 billion viruses in every mill. That is an extremely small amount of water, but that's 10 or hundreds of times more bacteria than there. These are mind boggling numbers. They are present everywhere. And of course, in sediments, in microbial mats, as you'd expect, microbial mats have a lot of bacteria. So they have many, many more times viruses. And like bacteria, viruses occur in all environments. Hot water, cold water, shallow water, deep water, down in the deep subsurface. They even occur in the rain. When it's raining, the rain is full of viruses because, of course, there are bacteria there. And we've heard talk about the possibility of viruses on Mars. Well, as we only heard two days ago, 
the possibility is there of viruses in the atmosphere of Venus. I'm sure you heard that. Well, nobody said viruses. They talked about microbial life, but that must mean viruses too. Anyway, um, most of us have got a very bad impression of viruses, but actually they are essential for the running of the Earth's system. The viruses provide a lot of nutrients. They're a food source. They're involved in breaking down organic matter and recycling and improving the gene pool. So viruses are not all bad. Now, one of the things about viruses, of course, is they're tiny, really, really small, tens to hundreds of meters in diameter. That is very, very small indeed. They often have a coating on the outside. Maybe they have a tail. They have a variable shape, as you can see over here on the left. But the thing to mention is that many viruses, especially those in the marine environment, are icosahedral. Now, you may not have heard of the word icosahedral before. It's the word of the talk, icosahedral. Icosahedral is like spheroidal, but it has size. It has faces, like this picture over on the right. Um, I mean, theoretically, it might have 20 faces on the sphere. It's a bit like an old-fashioned football with made of flat pieces of leather. But by comparison, bacteria, they are much bigger, 10, 10 times the size of viruses. They are on the micron scale. They are single cells, no nuclei, they are prokaryotes. So the point about viruses, they are so simple, they're very simple organisms. And the question really is, are they living? That's something which is not for me to answer. But the thing about viruses is they cannot reproduce by themselves. They need host cells. So some people say they're not really living. Uh, but what people often call them are parasites, intracellular parasites, because they need a cell in which to reproduce. So um, the virus latches onto a cell, as you can see here, the cell may be in our bodies, in plants, or it may be a bacterium. So the uh, virus hangs on to the cell, the bacteria, injects it with the virus's DNA. Then within the cell, new viruses develop. They multiply and maybe 50 or 100 new viruses develop. And then they burst out. That's the process called lysis. So um, the important thing Viruses need cells, they need bacteria. Um, the other thing to mention about viruses, like extracellular polymeric substance, which I'll mention, that's EPS, that's a mucus that occurs around bacteria and other things. Viruses have a negative charge, which means they can attract cations, things like calcium, magnesium, silicon. That's very significant, as will be revealed. So viruses are closely associated with bacteria and they have a long history, of course, bacteria going right back to the beginning of life. So might we expect viruses to go back that far as well? OK, a little bit of introduction. Now, we should say that the history of microbial carbonates goes right back to the beginning of life on Earth, we believe. The oldest stromatolites, microbialites, are around about four billion years ago, uh, found in Greenland. But the first fossils you really find of bacteria are definitely fossils are around about three and a half billion years ago. And then a bit later, about 1.8, we start to see eukaryotes, that's um, organisms with, with nuclei developing, and of course, eukaryotes, the group, includes the animals. So bacteria go right back to the beginning of life. They are the beginning of life, and the one might have well imagine that viruses are back there too. So the place where we see most effects of bacteria are within microbial mats. And I'm sure you will have seen many pictures of microbial mats from around the world. Here, famous places, Abu Dhabi, with all these very, very extensive flat microbial mats going on for kilometers and kilometers. 
the famous ones from Shark Bay, Bahamas, etc. You'll have all seen modern stromatolites made of bacteria and viruses. Um, and Precambrian stromatolites, also through the Phanerozoic, of course, plenty good examples of stromatolites. Uh, here's some lovely examples from Arctic Norway, ones I worked on in the 1970s. Classic stromatolites. And if you want some nearer home for some of you, here you can see some beautiful stromatolites from the Chattisgarh Basin in the Eastern Ghats of India. So stromatolites we see back through geological time. These are formed by microbial processes and a biofilm. So let's just say a few quick words about microbial mats. They consist of bacteria, cyanobacteria especially. They were the blue-green algae, but we don't call them blue-green algae anymore. Cyanobacteria, along with lots of other bacteria, sulfate-reducing bacteria, archaea, for example, uh, and some green algae there in modern ones, um, as well as fungi, diatoms, EPS, that's the mucus, extracellular polymeric substance, and viruses. And all these together form a biofilm. Um, well, within the biofilm, of course, you can have sediment trapped. If there are waves bringing in sediment, the sediment can be trapped by the biofilm and the filaments to, to produce the laminated structure we see of a stromatolite. But the microbes can also induce precipitation so that the stromatolite can become cemented. And, and we often find in microbial mats, crystals, minerals being precipitated in the microbial mat. And they're being precipitated because of the microbial processes that take place there. And of course, in the top layers of the microbial mat, the most important microbial process will be photosynthesis, the extraction of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, being used by the bacteria to produce organic matter. And as a result of this, the photosynthesis, then of course, oxygen is produced and the atmosphere becomes oxic, as happened over the millions, the billions of years, but produced as a side, um, a side effect is the precipitation of minerals, especially calcite, if you've got calcium in the seawater, mixing with the bicarbonate, which is produced by the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere dissolving in the water. We can pre precipitate calcite by this process. And if we've got magnesium present, we could precipitate dolomite, and so it goes on. And there are other bacterial microbial processes like sulfate reduction, denitrification, so there are a lot of microbial processes taking place in the microbial mat, which can result in mineral precipitation. That's microbial mats, but we also have tufa, travertine, where we see lots of bacteria and EPS, mucus, extracellular polymeric substances and viruses. So here you can see some pictures. Here's the EPS over the surface of these grains, coccoid bacteria, filamentous bacteria. Well, we've been studying microbial mats in Qatar in the Middle East. Uh, you can see these areas of microbial mat here from the aerial photograph. Here you can see the team looking at the microbial mats. The microbial mat is full of filamentous and coccoid bacteria, as you can see here. And we did this work, basically, we were looking at microbial mats as source rocks for hydrocarbons. And we precipitated a paper on this back in 2016 in organic geochemistry. But what I want to talk about at the minute are the minerals that we found precipitated in these microbial mats. And this we published in sedimentology in 2018. So if we look within the microbial mat, if we look in the top layers and gradually go down through the layers of the microbial mat, we see crystals, crystallites being precipitated there. Here you can see these, these uh, bundles of calcite, and sometimes we see dumbbell structures where more is precipitated. Here down the bottom left, you can see these fans, these bundles of calcite 
are growing into more crystal shapes. Look at this one here. You can see the trigonal shape, but there's a hole down the middle. And eventually they develop further, lower in the map, and now a few millimeters down in the map, mat, and you can see the crystal shapes developing. Crystals, calcite, being precipitated in microbial mat. And we also find dolomite here at the top. You can see some ROMs of dolomite or very high magnesium calcite. We find paligorskite, clay minerals being precipitated in the microbial mat. My magnesium silicates, aragonite, pyrite. So there are many crystals, different minerals being precipitated in microbial mats through microbial processes. The question that one should think though, is how do crystals begin to form? How do they nucleate? We'll come back to that in a minute. So if we have a now have a closer look at the microbial mat in terms of the viruses and the EPS that's present, the mucus, then what we can see is if we look with the scanning electron microscope, we can see the bacteria here, we can see one here, but what we often find are nanospheres. You can see these huge numbers of nanospheres in here. These are tens to hundreds of uh, nanometers in diameter. You can see they're all clustered together to form these clumps. And also between them, maybe you can pick out the mucus, the EPS, that's holding them together. And in fact, if you look more closely, you can see this bacterium, it has some of these round nanospheres attached to the surface. We think these nanospheres are viruses. We think these are the viruses in the mat. Now, the other really exciting thing is that these viruses, here you can see a close up of them, and you can see the shape, these nanospheres, look at the shape. The shape is not a perfect sphere. It's not a perfect nanosphere. Look, it actually seems to have sides to it. It looks like they're icosahedral, that word again. So we interpret these as viruses within this microbial mat. But the interesting thing is these viruses are being calcified. They are being converted to calcium carbonate. Now, how do we know that? Well, apart from using EDS, we can look to see what elements are present in this microbial mat. We can also use the scanning electron microscope in backscattered mode, which you can see on the right. So this is the, these are the same field of view. On the left, using secondary electrons, you get a pretty picture. You can see everything that's there. The, the bacteria, the viruses living on the bacteria, and these clumps of viruses. But over here on the right, this is backscatter. So it, it gives you an image of different shades of gray, depending on the atomic number of the elements in the particles. So what you can see is you can hardly see our bacterium. That's because it's made of, of course, organic matter, carbon and oxygen, a bit of hydrogen maybe. And you can't see these tiny um, uh, viruses on the end of the bacterium. You can't see the EPS here. It's not present. You can't see it. But what you can see is that our clusters of nanospheres have a very bright, pale gray, almost a white uh, color. And that's because they've picked up higher elements than carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. These contain calcium, a bit of sulfur, a bit of uh, magnesium, etc. So they are being calcified. They're being mineralized. Now, here with the transmission electron microscope, you can see the cocoid bacteria. Here's a filamentous bacterium. Look around the outside. These dark um, electron dense areas, these are all particles. They are all bits of mineral being precipitated there in the mu mucus around the outside of the bacterium. But notice they are tiny, tiny little grains. They are probably mineralized viruses. Okay, so here's a beautiful example of a bacterium 
surrounded by the EPS, you can see it there, and inside the bacterium, you can see these tiny round nanospheres. You can see them. That's because they've been partly mineralized. So we can check that by looking with the EDS, looking at the uh, elements developed in the field of view. Um, and you can see very clearly, we've got an increase in calcium in the areas around these particular bacteria because the EPS and the viruses within them are being mineralized. And there you can see the calcium. You can pick out a bit of magnesium in there, but not a lot. You can see the sulfur in, the, in that area around the bacteria, a bit of silicon and a bit of aluminium. So these viruses, the EPS, they're being mineralized. In other words, we are forming fossilized viruses. Here's a nice example. Here you can see the bacterium, no cell wall to this one. These funny things here, if you wonder what they are, that's part of the uh, photosynthetic apparatus, the thylakoids, showing that these are photosynthetic bacteria. You can see all the viruses, and you can see they're dark. They're picking up some color. They're becoming darker. That's because they're being mineralized. Okay, well, that's calcite, um, calcium carbonate being precipitated within the microbial mat today. In the top millimeters, the viruses are being fossilized. But we see the same thing in hot springs. Here's a paper from a few years ago showing viruses inside a, my, a bacterium which have been replaced. They've been silicified. So here you can see these viruses very clearly here. And they've been coated by silica and they are replaced by silica themselves as well. And people have also reported that iron may be precipitated in association with viruses. So here's, you can see the virus is very clearly here, and you can see the iron that's been precipitated in association with the viruses. This is coming from an iron-rich stream in, the, in southern Spain, the Rio Tinto area, where of course there are a lot of iron deposits, as you can tell from the name. So here we've got viruses which are involved in the precipitation of iron minerals. And of course, you can immediately think how significant that is for the banded iron formations we see back in the Precambrian. So we have fossilized viruses. Well, um, uh, there have been many experiments carried out on experimental precipitation. Um, here is just showing some examples from uh, some colleagues of mine in China. We published many papers, about 10 papers in the last two years on using bacteria to precipitate calcium carbonate and other things, as you can see here. Uh, and you can see the precipitates here around the bacteria, intracellular precipitates, extracellular precipitates from the different bacteria just as we were describing from the microbial mats. But what we've been doing ourselves is carrying out experiments with viruses to precipitate carbonates. So we've taken viruses from E. coli, a bacteria which some of you might have come across, unfortunately. It's a very common bacteria giving stomach upsets. You find it in sewage, but these days you find lots of E. coli in rivers, lakes, and in the shallow seas. So E. coli is the bacteria, but associated with it, it has a virus. Bacterial viruses are often called bacteriophages or just phages. So phages are viruses associated with bacteria. So we've separated the viruses, you can see here and here, from the E. coli bacteria. That takes a lot of effort, not me. I'm working with my microbiologist friends. Um, so you can see the viruses very clearly and notice how the viruses often coalesce together to form larger accumulations. So we've carried out our experiments by mixing together sodium carbonate and calcium chloride with different concentrations using different concentrations of the solution, but different amounts of the viruses as well. So we've used experiments 
with a billion viruses in a mill of fluid. And what we find is calcium carbonate is being precipitated. And here you can see our precipitates, tiny nanospheres. Some of them grow into slightly larger dumbbell structures. Some of them grow to be about the size of a micron. So we have, with the uh, effect of the phages, with the presence of the viruses, we see these different minerals being precipitated, different shapes, and they're different from the crystals we see precipitated in control experiments, which have no bacteria or viruses within them. We have lots of tiny particles, 40 to 60 nanometers in size. And when you look at the tiny, tiny particles, you can see here, look at the shapes. The shapes are not perfect nanospheres. You can see, it looks like they've got, they've got flat sides. So what we are showing with our experiments, not published yet, hopefully it'll be out very shortly, is that viruses do have an influence in carbonate precipitation in terms of the crystal size, the particles that are precipitate, the shapes. They often coalesce as you can see here. But we also find there's a difference in mineralogy. In the control experiment, we mostly have calcite precipitated, only calcite. But when you have the viruses present, most of the precipitate is vaterite. Now, vaterite is a bit like uh, amorphous calcium carbonate. It's a metatable phase, which is precipitated first by the viruses, and then vaterite in time, hours or days, changes to calcite. Okay, so back to our crystals being precipitated. Viruses are being mineralized. We can see that, we've shown that. And the question is, do they then bring about further precipitation? We suggest that the viruses could be the seeds, the nuclei for further crystal growth. Now, if you look at the crystals I was showing you earlier on in the microbial mats, you'll see that the crystals are growing from tiny little points. Look at the end of these crystals, tiny points. So that's where the crystals are growing from, from little nucleation points. But what can those nucleation points be? What can have started them off? Um, well, of course, it's very difficult to see what nucleated a dolomite rom, the nucleation points in the middle. And with many of these calcite crystals, you can't see exactly what's there because it's such a tiny place or it's hidden by further precipitation. But how do crystals precipitate? Well, there are two ways. One is by direct precipitation. That's homogeneous, spontaneous nucleation. In other words, you have a solution, and out of that solution, the minerals, the crystals are precipitated. And that's not very easy to happen. It really only happens when you force the mineral out of precipitation, out of the fluid, by having a highly concentrated, supersaturated solution. That's homogeneous, spontaneous nucleation. It happens suddenly, directly. But that's not a simple process for crystals. It's much easier to have precipitation take place if you've got <clears throat> seeds or nuclei. And that's called heterogeneous nucleation. So where can we get the seeds or the nuclei from to precipitate calcium carbonate? Well, we get them from the viruses and within the EPS. The first stage then is the mineralization of these tiny, tiny virus particles or the threads in the EPS. Then we've got the nuclei. Then the nuclei can be where further crystals take place. So we would say that there is a biogenic, a viral process to initiate calcium carbonate precipitation. Once you've got the seeds, then abiotic precipitation takes over afterwards. Okay, so what about the geological record of viruses? Well, we all know about the geological record of life. That goes back to about 4,000 million years, when there is the evidence of the first 
stromatolites coming from Greenland, as I mentioned earlier. We don't find any bacterial cells to about three and a half thousand million years ago. And, and then later on, of course, we see the first eukaryotes uh, around about two thousand years ago. But most microbiologists, virologists, I'm not quite sure which um, <laughs> discipline of biological sciences they're in, but most people who study viruses think they actually go back to the beginning of life, if not just before. Maybe they're the things that evolved first before life developed a little bit later, all to do with the formation of proteins, RNA and DNA and so on. But um, I think we can, m most people would agree that viruses were probably created right at the beginning in Charles Darwin's warm little pond. But the thing about viruses, of course, like uh, organisms in general, they continued to evolve as organisms evolve because viruses need cells and bacteria. So new viruses would evolve just like animals and plants have evolved through time. But what this means is we should find fossil viruses back in the geological record. OK, so how are we going to recognize fossil viruses? Well, not easy, has to be said. First of all, the size range, they're very, very small. You can only see them with an uh, electron microscope. Then we, when we do find them, we might expect them to be present in large numbers. Um, large numbers because viruses are present in huge numbers, um, as you can see in these little pictures here. Um, large numbers, all the nanospheres are about the same size. So that's, that's one thing. The shape, now as I've been saying, the shape of the nanospheres is not a perfect sphere, it's more icosahedral. And if you look very carefully at these images here, they are not perfect, perfect spheres. You can see that it looks like there are flat sides. So the shape is one thing. But of course, there is a preservation issue. Once you formed the fossil virus, as I have said, it may act as the nuclei for further precipitation. So you can fossilize the virus, but then that virus may be the place where more crystals grow. So you'll get overgrowth and crystals developed on the nanospheres, and they may all coalesce to form bigger crystals. As you can see in this picture here, a picture from a tufa, you can see all the tiny nanospheres looking like fossilized viruses, but you can see the calcite crystals are forming very close by as if the viral fossil viruses have amalgamated together to develop the calcite crystals. So that's one problem. But the context, we should expect viruses, of course, to be associated with bacteria. So we look in stromatolites is the obvious place to look. Places where, especially where the stromatolites is silicified, here's a nice silicified stromatolite um, from the Precambrian with lots of filaments, that's where we should look for the fossilized viruses. And the mineralogy, as I've been showing, they can be composed of carbonate, calcite, aragonite, dolomite, but we have this issue of recrystallization. So it may be difficult to recognize, but they can be silicified in hot springs, as I said. And silica generally is a bit more resistant to recrystallization. Here you can see the silicified viruses. And of course, they could be phosphatized. A lot of phosphate is associated with microbes and bacteria, high nutrient supply. You would expect a lot of viruses in phosphate rich environments. So we would expect viruses throughout the geological, the fossil record, but recognizing them can be tricky. However, if you go back and look at some of the photomicrographs, the SEM pictures in the literature, you can find structures that could well be fossilized viruses. Look at this picture from the um, Paleoproterozoic in Canada. Look at these tiny, tiny nanospheres. They are the right size. They're all about the right size. 
for them to be fossilized viruses. And again, look carefully at the shape. They are not perfect spheres. It looks like they've got flat surfaces. Are they a cosahedral? So that's silicified ones. And here's an example of a paleoproterozoic phosphoride with remains of microbes. You can see the microbes in here, the filaments. The sort of, but look, there are many tiny, tiny nanospheres in here. You can see them. You can see them. So are these phosphatized viruses? And the size, the shape, everything, just as one might expect. Okay, so fossilized viruses, yes, we should be able to find them. But is there a significance for viruses beyond microbial mats? Could the effect of viruses happen uh, in other situations, in other environments? Well, one thing that's been very puzzling for carbonate sedimentologists is the origin of whitings. Whitings are when lagoons and shallow seas suddenly go white. And people have often said it's the precipitation of calcium carbonate. Um, maybe it's due to fish. Some people have suggested it's fish stirring up the seafloor. But there's a lot of evidence that it actually is precipitation of calcium carbonate. Um, in some cases, it's the result of dust coming from the Sahara across like to the Caribbean, the Bahamas, or cold currents coming up onto the Bahama platform. These nutrients, these currents, they cause a burst in the activity of planktic cyanobacteria. And what do you get with cyanobacteria? 10 times the number of them, you get viruses. So whenever you have a phytoplankton bloom, you will get millions of viruses associated with them. Viruses, as we've said, are relatively easy to mineralize, and then you can get the precipitation of the calcium carbonate. So maybe whitings are related to viruses, related to the bacterial blooms. And then, of course, throughout the geological record, we have numerous fine-grained limestones right the way through, right into the Precambrian, fine-grained micritic limestones. What's the origin of the micrite? You can't see any evidence when you look with the scanning electron microscope. People say, oh, direct precipitation of lime mud of calcite from seawater. But as I said, it's not easy to precipitate calcium carbonate directly from seawater. It's better if you've got seeds, you've got nuclei. If you've got planktonic bacteria with their viruses, then you could bring about the precipitation of calcium carbonate very easily. Um, and peloids, of course. We have peloids throughout the geological record. Here you can see some nice ones from the Lesser Himalaya. Here you see all these peloids. And you remember the peloids I was showing to you? The viral peloids, the collections of nanospheres? Maybe peloids are related to viruses and the bacteria that are also there because you need viruses and bacteria. Okay, finally, um, we've heard a lot about OOIDs in the last two or three years in, since 2017. Um, when there was a paper published by uh, Maria Diaz um, and, and uh, um, other people um, about OOIDs having a microbial origin produced by bacteria, um, discovering EPS, mucus, and bacteria within OOIDs. It's been suggested before. It's been suggested right back to the 19th century. The OOIDs may be microbial, bacterial in origin. But when you look at these SCM micrographs, you can see large numbers of nanospheres. In fact, the paper here points out the nanospheres. So why can't the nanospheres here be permineralized viruses? Um, look at the shape of them. Just take these two here. Look at the shape. Slightly irregular shape. So maybe OOIDs also are precipitated through the activity of viruses. 
Okay, and finally, this is just something that you almost can't help thinking about. Are viruses related to extinction? Could viruses play a role in extinction? Well, I'm not the first person to suggest this, of course, uh, but it just strikes me that the field is open for more research. When you look at extinction, we have two types of extinction. We have mass extinction, <clears throat> which we know a lot about. Um, when a whole host of organisms become extinct at the same time. And of course, the mass extinctions, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, Permo-Triassic, etc., they are related to really catastrophic events, meteorite impact, volcanism, even climate change. But at the same time, throughout geological time, we have background extinctions where a particular species become extinct. Um, and of course, this is the basis of biostratigraphy. But those background extinctions, how do they happen? Well, Cesare Emiliani, a very famous um, Forearm, forearm paleontologist noted these background extinctions in a, in a paper and suggested they could be related to the effect of viruses. They could be a fundamental part of the process of evolution caused by some environmental upset of some kind. Well, you might have read in the news just two or three days ago, there is a new mass extinction event, number six in the middle of the Triassic. So here's a diagram, you'll see it on the latest science news sites. This is an area, I think, which is wide open for further research. So to conclude, viruses, I think, are completely neglected in earth science. They must have played many roles. Viruses do become fossilized. I think we can see that very clearly in our modern microbial mats. And I think we are finding fossilized viruses back into the Precambrian. And as I've said, one of the most important geological uh, roles of viruses is probably in providing seeds and nuclei, nuclei for carbonate precipitation and precipitation other um, minerals. And it could well be there's a role of viruses in species extinction, which needs to be further explored. So I would say virus is the new frontier in earth sciences, maybe especially carbonate sedimentology. So go for it. Finally, thanks very much for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed these things. And uh, want any more information, there you can see my latest paper, which came out a few days ago. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for this refreshing and enlightening talk. We have received uh, several questions from our audience, which are in the process of being compiled. Once done, we'll surely like to address the questions to our speaker. In the meanwhile, I would like to remind everyone that our we have tomorrow another lecture on sedimentary petrology scheduled at 11 a.m. Indian Standard Time by Professor Prabir Dashgupta, Head of the Department of Geology, Durgapur Government College, India, on the topic of mass flow dynamics and appraisal. We are really overwhelmed by all your responses to our endeavor so far and would be even more happy by your presence in our upcoming lecture session. Please wait just a few moments and then we will start our Q&A session. Sir, no, I think you can stop your sharing, stop sharing now. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Thank you for your patience. We have all our questions now. Please 
that owing to a large number of questions that we have received and also due to time constraint we will not be able to address all of them to our speakers we shall try to make as many as possible to the speakers within the stipulated time we have we are now ready to discuss few of the questions and that we have received for the first question we have from mr orkojoti pathak pg student iit bombay he has asked uh, can viruses be used to reconstruct the paleo ecology and used as paleo thermometer how to decipher the micro niche from the altered carbonate formations well i think uh, i think the point is viruses are an important component of any um microbial community and of course viruses are associated with um not just microbes with uh, animals and plants as well so uh, it's all a question of looking in um great detail at the um the situation in hand at the fossils or whatever um using detailed techniques uh scanning electron microscope um maybe biomarkers will be recognized that are related to viruses i think this is um a, a new field in earth sciences so it's a question of applying techniques from other disciplines and seeing what we can find i think that answers this question the second question we have from orchishman choudhury he is a student of presidency university bsc third year does diagenesis and dolomitization events have any effect on the signature of abundance of viruses in that rock and if so what are they um i am sure that viruses could well be involved in the precipitation of dolomite just like people talk about bacteria involved if bacteria are involved vir viruses will be involved so it's a question of looking with this scm at the details of the dolomite crystals and there are many papers now which are showing microbes bacteria closely associated with dolomite one should look at with the scm in more detail a higher resolution and look and i'm sure the viruses will be there and the viruses could easily be the seeds for the precipitation of the dolomite the mineralogy of the fossilized viruses will depend on the composition of the fluid um the composition of the seawater the composition of the fluid in the cells um on redox on trace element contents so the minerals that will be precipitated by the viruses will vary and there's no reason why viruses can't be involved in the precipitation of dolomite thank you sir the third question is from dr shimontini shem sharma post doctoral fellow indian institute of science bangalore is there a possibility of virus been nucleating agent for precambrian bifs or modern day polymetallic nodule deposits yes <laughs> in a word yes viruses are everywhere so they can be involved in all of these processes of mineral precipitation just like bacteria viruses will be there as well and maybe it's really the viruses rather than the bacteria that are involved in the precipitation it's these are all things to be explored uh, then mit simran kor research scholar from university of california berkeley has asked primarily what sort of mineral associations are seen in this mineralized viruses and secondly what sort of control does the microbes or microbial mats have on the virus nanospheres um 
I, I didn't actually what what you it was what type of minerals the first part what type of minerals what type of mineral associations are seen in this mineralized viruses well um what we have found is that viruses are mineralized by calcium carbonate that's clear other people have described viruses being mineralized by silica the, the, they can be mineralized by or, or they can cause minerals to be precipitated almost any minerals you like depending on the composition of the water that's the important thing it depends on the fluid that's there so you can precipitate calcite dolomite aragonite it depends on the on the conditions of the fluid Our professor Nilanjan Dashgupta sir has asked, what is the effect of temperature on the fossilized viruses? Effect of temperature. Um, now that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one in the sense that um, most natural environments are sort of 20 to 30 degrees centigrade but uh, we do know that viruses can survive at extremely high temperatures um, hundreds of degrees and also at very low temperatures um, the arctic ice for example is covered in viruses um, as which, which of course need a host so the arctic ice, ice is also covered in bacteria so for the most part, uh, in natural environments, uh, the temperature is not an, an important issue. There may be certain temperatures where the viruses prefer to grow, um, but um, basically they can survive all temperatures in natural environments. So temperature is, is not a real obstacle. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bishal Shah from Presidency University has asked, can these viruses be reactivated if their crystal structure is broken? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I, uh, that's a strange question. Um, viruses uh, don't, the, the viruses themselves don't produce a crystal structure. Um, viruses uh, are mineralized by attracting the ions, the cations, to the virus, and the virus itself then becomes mineralized. So the structure of the mineral will depend on which mineral is being precipitated there. Um, is that does that answer the question? I'm not quite sure. Slightly unusual question. Thank you, sir. Then I will ask the next question. Uh, Mr. Pranil Basu, University of Kolkata, has asked, how do the sedimentologists infer the nanospheres are actually viruses, not any other mysterious things? Well, by looking very closely at the shape and the size, as I was suggesting in one of my slides. Um, yes, there are, there are many uh, natural abiotic processes that can produce nanospheres. One has to look very carefully. And I've, as I said, things like the shape, the size, the variation, these are all factors. It's, but it's very difficult to prove it until we have some chemical means, um, which, which of course <laughs> can also be a problem. But until we can identify the, the presence of viruses from something like biomarkers, People are working on biomarkers to identify viruses from bacteria. So maybe that's a route one can go down. Thank you, sir. Anisur Hawk from Presidency University has asked, can viruses be linked to current ongoing extinction? Well, what, what extinction on to, can they can be linked? Can viruses to be linked to current ongoing extinction? 
Oh. Ha. <laughs> well, that's an that's an interesting one. Um, I mean, the the thing about uh, viruses, um, every organism has its own, more or less, has its own virus. Viruses are uh, attracted, or they, they need particular cells or particular bacteria. So it's difficult to see uh, viruses um, causing the extinction of, them, of huge numbers of different organisms. In, as we have a lot of organisms becoming extinct now. But it's difficult to see that viruses would cause that because, as I say, each animal, each bacteria needs has its own virus. That's why viruses can cause extinction of individual species, but un not necessarily all of the species, even of that kind. So it, it, this is the sort of thing that people should be looking at because a major environmental change as we are having climate change environmental global change that could affect lots of animals in one particular area where that change is occurring because the climate change has different types of change of course different effects so it could be that in some areas the climate change does cause the viruses to expand or increase in their toxicity. So that's possible, but I can't see it affecting uh, the, the world as a whole. But that's something to ask a biologist. I'm a humble sedimentologist. Uh, Debarun Mukherjee from UG3 student, Presidency University has asked, other than morphological features like isohedral uh, shape and uh, what are the vi various methods that may be used to distinguish fossil viruses from other silicified or calcified crystals yes that's right that's that's the that's the that's the exciting thing that we are finding that there are some particular characters of nanospheres produced by viruses, which we can use to distinguish them from nanospheres forming by abiotic processes. Yes, look at the shape of the nanospheres. Miss Anisha Ghosh, Jadavpur University has asked, can viruses be nuclei for microcrystalline char and iron oxyhydroxide minerals in Precambrian iron formation? Uh, yes, yes we'll do. Yes is a good answer to that. But I think the viruses will be there first and then the, the, the silica and the iron minerals will precipitate around the viruses. Yes. Uh, Shinjan Roy from Presidency University Kolkata has asked, how does virus act as a nuclei for the carbonate precipitation. Is there any possibility that carbonates may have been formed by adsorption? What was the last word? By? Adsorption. Ah. Well, the, um, the viruses become calcified. So you have this tiny, tiny um, collection of calcium carbonate um where at, at the virus and that becomes a tiny calcite crystal which is then the nucleus that that's how the nucleation works you, you calcify the virus it's so small that it can then act as the nucleus for the growth of bigger crystals that's not a problem often people when they're making minerals in the in um in experiments or uh even in industry they use seeds to make the minerals precipitate in the first place that's what i'm suggesting 
the viruses are the seeds once they've been mineralized. I have to tell you. Our second last question is from Shubhadeep Karmukar, ex student, Presidency University. Uh, uh, in the uh, first, with greetings, uh, sorry, uh, great. Uh, we saw climate change effects, microbes population, and how are they crucial for managing the climate change? Uh, I think once we start talking about climate change, that's on a much, much bigger scale than, um, than we're discussing here. Um, I, I as I've said a few minutes ago, there can be some consequences for viruses from climate change. A, a particular change in an environment may make uh, viruses develop much more. But by and large, I don't think the viruses um, are, are that closely involved with the, the climate change that we're seeing at the present time. So our last question is from Onkita Mukherjee, Jogomaya Devi College, India. Can we find fossilized viruses only in association with bacteria, as in stromatolites or in any other creature which it can be used as a host? Ah, no, that's a good question, that one. That's a good question. Um, Certainly, the easiest place to find viruses is in associated with back, in association with bacteria. But as we know, um, all cells in humans and animals and plants they can be attacked by viruses. So there's no reason why, in well-preserved, often silicified um, material, you shouldn't find of of plants for example, that you shouldn't be able to look for the nanospheres. There are some uh, many examples of petrified forests where the trees or the plants have been silicified. That's where I would look for nanospheres to make to see if there was any bacterial microbial infection of those plants. So it should be possible. You don't necessarily be look, have to be looking in stromatolites. Thank you so much, sir. We have almost come to the end of today's lecture session of Geochron 2020. I would like to call Ankon Bhattacharya to present the vote of thanks to our speaker. So sorry to interrupt you. You can stop sharing now. Me? The topmost button beside the leaf at the corner. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, thank you, Debaruti Di. So, a very good evening and afternoon to everyone. So, it gives me immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks today. First and foremost, I would like to thank Professor Maurice Tucker, who despite his busy schedule has found some time to grace this event. <laughs> thank you so much for such an interesting and wonderful lecture. We are very much eager to maintain this relationship of love amongst us and we hope to have you with us in any future workshop or lecture we organize. Please visit the Department of Geology Presidency University whenever you find yourself in Kolkata. I would also like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all our faculty members and also a very special thanks to Professor Sharbani Patranobish Dev, faculty member of the ISI Kolkata Geological Studies Unit, without whom the entire lecture would have been impossible. Last but not the least, a big thanks to all my friends and participants for such an enormous cooperation. We had about 200 participants on our MS teams, so thank you everyone. Hope to see you all again uh, tomorrow as we reconvene at 11 a.m. Uh, before ending the session, uh, I would just like to take a screenshot to preserve the memory.
ओके सो द स्क्रीन शॉट हैज बीन सो थैंक यू एवरी वन फॉर बींग विथ आस थ्रू आउट द लेक्चर सेशन इट मीन्स अ लॉट टू आस एंड टिल देन एड यू हैव अ नाइस डे एंड स्टे सेफ Okay. Yes, sir. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so that's goodbye then. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm leaving now. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Bye, bye. Bye, 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 sir. Thanks bye, bye. a lot, sir. Thank you so much. participants may leave the uh, teams if they want to